go to the movies and you got to sit upstairs and if you ride along in a car there's no place to stop and eat and use the bathroom if you get on the bus you got to go and sit in the back of the bus so all of these were irritants you know it's just that until 55 we didn't have the understanding of how to change it who and then you had a leader like Dr. King and Rosie Parks who came along and said, we, we're better than this, we can change it. On March 2nd, 1955, a 15-year-old girl named Claudette Colvin was kicked off of a city bus in Montgomery, Alabama. The NAACP decided not to use her as the face of their revolution because she was still just a minor, as well as pregnant. Edie Nixon, the leader of the NAACP, said, I had to be sure that I had somebody I could win with. On December 1st, 1955, another black seamstress named Rosa Parks was also kicked off of a bus in Montgomery. When asked to move back a row for a white man, she refused. The bus driver threatened to call the cops, to which Rosa Parks replied, You may do that. To no surprise, the bus driver did. When she was in the police's custody, she asked the policeman, Why do you all do this to us? All the policeman had to say was, I don't know. But the law is the law, and you're going to jail. We were so involved right from day one until it was like being a piece of a start right there because we were right downtown. Mrs. Parks had been arrested. Her husband was, he was out of his head because he didn't realize that she was going to decide that the, she was going to be the one to be arrested. So he was very fearful, you know. So it was kind of like turmoil for the first two or three days. And then the mass meeting started, and then, you know, we, we started to think together, start to feel together, you know, start to believe that we could make some changes. Rosa Parks' arrest gave the NAACP the opportunity they had been waiting for. They sent out flyers to blacks all over Montgomery, informing them and asking them to join the impending boycott. Most joined, but many refused out of fear of the whites. Martin Luther King Jr. was chosen to be the leader of the boycott because he had no family in Montgomery and could leave if things got violent. The boycott was scheduled to start on December 3rd and was only supposed to last a day, but ended over a year later. Over that time, transportation was made possible by churches and other black individuals who purchased cars to use in carpools. The drivers of these rolling churches were pulled over by police multiple times every day. That the churches, community organizations, punished cars for blacks, uh, riders. The people who used to ride the bus, they punished cars. And there were several cabs stand down there who had decided that if you didn't have any money, you could ride. But there was areas where there were cars where people picked up all of the time, all day. Ministers and, and deacons of the church and organizations of the elves and those, those people who wanted to help out with the movement got involved by taking people from point A to point B. If you had a job, you could come to a certain point downtown and get a ride there. When black churches in the North heard about the boycott, they were very excited to see this new movement and the new black leader, Martin Luther King Jr. They sent money for the black churches in the South to buy station wagons to carpool. They also sent shoes. 90% of the bus riders were black, the city bus system was losing $3,000 per day, equal to roughly $18,000 per day today. White city officials worked as hard as they could to stop the boycott. Police surveillance was harsher than ever before, and there were even laws that made boycotting illegal. Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested for going 5 miles per hour over the speed limit. There was also a law that set a minimum charge for taxi rides in an effort to make more people switch back to the buses because of the cost. You know, we just knew that that we were always um, being watched, and and there was always the possibility that something was going to happen because the police were trying to do everything they could at the direction of the city officials to break up this boycott. They would watch the people that were being picked up, where they were being picked up, how many were being picked up, where they were taken, how often they were taken, and unfortunately, who was doing the driving. My father and uncles and other cab companies, the other people who worked for the company at the time, were pulled over all the time. We had two drivers to be killed. One was killed right in front of the cab stand. 
the Supreme Court declared the segregation of buses unconstitutional with the ruling on the Browder v. Gale case. 381 days after it began, the boycott ended. Most black people began to ride buses again, and the newspapers and cameras came to take pictures and film of blacks sitting next to whites. King continued the struggle for civil rights until the end of his life on April 4, 1968. The Montgomery bus boycott inspired African Americans to keep aiming for racial equality, and in 1965, the Voting Rights Act was passed. The revolution spread worldwide, and nonviolent tactics were used to overthrow the apartheid regime in South Africa. The win for black folk hadn't happened before. We had never won a battle with whites. 381 days the battle went on, and when we won December of that year, we realized for the first time that you could win a battle with freedom for your own civil rights. That's when the movement really got started. <laughs> The Montgomery bus boycott sparked the Civil Rights Revolution. The first peaceful revolution in American history placed Martin Luther King Jr. at its helm and showed that a community could change the world through nonviolent means. I think it was the most impressive, exciting, exhilarating thing that blacks have ever done. I think. It was one of those moments in history that we were able to change not only Montgomery, Alabama, but change the world. There's one song that you will hear and you still hear around the world, We Shall Overcome. That was a kind of rallying cry song for the movement. And no matter whether it's South, Af South Africa, Poland, whatever it is, I heard them singing it in when they, uh, the revolution in the Middle East, people were saying we shall overcome. Unbelievable <laughs> that it had traveled the world, <laughs> that song, a simple song, but it had a lot of meaning to it. Just about everybody that I work with usually have a A-plus in their project. <laughs>